Okay, I think I will make a start. Thanks everyone for joining. We have a 115, I think, in total in the in the session. So thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to this next installment of our regular feature, the uh, we call the Employment Law Lab with Bernice Paul. So thanks so much for joining. My name is David Morgan. I'm a partner in the Employment Law team here. I'm also joined by Rachel Mackay, who hopefully you can see on screen also. Rachel's um, a senior solicitor in our team and the two of us will be presenting the session for you today. Um, main topic is, uh, I've called it the Summer of Discontent, Top 10 Tips on Dealing with Trade union disputes and industrial relations in the workplace um, and I'll hand over to Rachel after to give you a roundup um, of some case and legislative updates uh, to look out for for the future um, and we are slated to finish up um, sharpish at 1.30 today. Um, so a couple of housekeeping points as ever. Many of you um, are familiar, um, I know, with these, uh, with the format. Um, please do keep yourself on mute if you don't mind, given the numbers involved, it is hard to chip in. So please instead use the chat function. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share um, along the way, and Rachel and I will do our best to take questions if we can, or we will follow up afterwards. And of course, as ever, please follow up with your usual contacts in the team here at Burness Paul for any particular and specific advice. This is just generic advice that we'll be giving uh, in the course of the session over lunchtime. Um, the session is being recorded. Please don't be put off by that. Um, that really is just so that we have a record that we can then share um, with others who have not been able to join or who registered that haven't managed to, uh, to join. And we will follow up with our written employment law lab paper, um, a, a quarterly um, uh, update that will follow within the next couple of weeks. So you'll have a copy of that if you've signed up for this um, session as well. So without further ado, I'll, I will um, get kicked off with the main session. And um, as this is over lunch hour, you know, the saying is no such thing as a free lunch. I will ask you all to make sure you're awake to take part in a short quiz, a short poll. Um, so Emma, if you could please uh, pull up uh, the first question, which I see in my screen, hopefully you can all do so. Um, so let's answer the first question first of all. Uh, which is what is union density in the private sector? Um, and straight into similar question for number two, what is union density unsurprisingly in the public sector? Okay, so if everyone hopefully on your devices, whether mobile or otherwise, you will get a chance uh, to see the screen and please click away. I'll take a pause until the answers settle down. Okay, 133 for it's still going up. Well, okay, I think that looks like it's pretty much settled, Emma. If you want to do an end poll, and we can look at the scores on the doors. Okay, good mix of um of attendance in uh, the room uh, today, so to speak, uh, amongst um, private, not for profit, and public sector. So the first question. Um, the well, very low in 52. The the majority certainly, I think, score there is 14%, which is absolutely right. So um, in the private sector, 14%, which is many find surprisingly low, not least given the summer of discontent and the volume we're going to talk about of the trade union movement just now. So it's only 14% uh, percent in the uh, private sector, and probably to be expected in the public sector higher. So most people going in at 77% and no, not as high as that. The last stats I saw in the Office for National Statistics uh, prints the uh, and, and publishes the statistics every year. It's actually 56.3. So higher certainly than the, the private sector, but absolutely not you know, a vast windfall type majority. Um, so 56.3 rather than the 77 for uh, the public sector, but certainly much more uh, relevant um, as you would expect in that sector. I'll stop sharing the poll and hopefully don't uh, lose you. Okay, so against that background then, there has been 
quite a decline actually in recent years and successive years there has been a decline in union membership and as I say those statistics when you look at them are perhaps not as high as one might think at 30 percent on average across the UK workforce around six million people in the world of work um, out of a workforce of 30 million um, are union members however they are still incredibly relevant not least as I say if you look at what we've been seeing with industrial disputes with pay disputes with the cost of living crisis even during COVID the trade union movement really grappled did they not um, with uh, employers um, to push the agenda so despite the decline in membership there's certainly been an increase in the volume as I put it and the voice of the trade union movement um, pushing forward the agenda on behalf of uh, workers. I presented a talk, a series of talks actually back in 2017, and it was on the back of the uh, new legislation. I still think of it. It was new in the scheme of things. The, the main law uh, governing trade unions was back in 92, but there was a, va a, a massive overhaul of the law in relation to industrial action with the Trade Union Act of 2016, um, which was implemented in 2017. And, and, and a couple of things I said when I did that series of presentations, some of you may have attended, um, was first of all, there was nothing good in that law. It was a Tory-led, actually a coalition government at the time, but a Tory-led uh, initiative ultimately um, that reined in the right to strike greatly. So there was nothing good in it for the trade union movement. Um, so the old Ron Seal saying, it doesn't do what it says on the tin. It was, uh, it was nothing positive for the trade union movement there. And I presented um, in that session once to a, a group of employers at our employment law group, um, that we all attend. And I, and I had a slide that said, could you go through your entire career and not advise on industrial action? And the reason for that was that the, the Trade Union Act made it considerably more difficult for unions uh, to get a strike off the ground, to get industrial action off the ground. And the kind of headline grabbing one in the HR circles at the time was a threshold support of 50 percent. So for a union to get a strike ballot off the ground, they had to get 50 percent of members uh, coming out and bothering their backside to vote. And that was my provocation. I actually felt, and forgive me for obviously the majority in this room will be employers. I thought that was quite sad in a way because, you know, there is a richness actually to the experience for those in the HR community advising on a very complex area of law. Bet the ranch I often talk about. It certainly gets the attention of the boardroom and chief executive level if you could be facing industrial action. We scroll ahead now to 2022 and certainly you might be saying I was wrong in that because we've had our fill and despite um, the difficult threshold for unions, we have certainly seen in our own practice and, of course, up and down the country from train drivers, uh, from uh, Royal Mail workers to barristers of all people uh, in the city of London calling industrial action. And um, so it's still highly relevant. It's still there and uh, something for us all to be uh, very mindful of and to advise uh, the companies that we represent in HR and employment law. And even still further reigning in of that. Um, we've had the mini budget, uh, uh, quasi Quarteng's uh, mini budget uh, last week, um, perhaps lost in some of the, the, the more uh, larger headlines around uh, tax cuts, etc. cetera. Um, the Conservative government are still gonna be pushing forward more limitation by the looks of things uh, to the right to strike. Uh, the Chancellor confirmed plans to, to uh, force transport companies to maintain a minimum level of service during industrial action. And that was in their 2019 uh, manifesto commitments anyway. Um, but the main one that I read over the weekend was uh, talk about having and a requirement for trade unions to put pay offers to members, first of all, uh, during pay negotiations before they're allowed to go ahead and, and, and ballot for strike. Now, in my practice, we tend to see that happen anyway, but more informally with the so-called consultative ballots. So that's interesting. It sounds as though what the, the, the government is talking about doing is putting a threshold, an actual vote before a union can knock back a pay deal. 
Uh, so it seemed to be more democratic. Uh, the union movement, as you'd imagine, are up in arms over this. Mick Lynch, uh, who garnered a lot of attention, didn't he, over the rail strikes, has already come out and said that he's enraged by this change. So I think further um, legislative change, we're going to see little detail yet, but it looks as though, again, we're still going to see something of a battle uh, between the current government um, and the trade union movement. So with that in mind, let me uh, pull up my uh, slides and I will uh, walk you through. Um, thumbs up, Rachel, if I could. Is that showing on the screen? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll kick off then. But before I get to my top 10 tips, I really just wanted to touch on that. And this is an article I, I, I pulled off. I think it was almost exactly to the day a year ago. And the reason I think I know that is the uh, Labour Party um, are in their conference season just now. And this was just after last year's uh, Labour uh, Party conference and the scandal, if you like, or it was a bit of a headline uh, um, uh, at the time in some of the press was that Sharon Graham, who you'll probably know as the current general secretary, she was newly appointed at the time of the largest union in the country, Unite. She didn't turn up at the Labour Party conference. So there was headlines, and depending what, polit what party or what paper, I should say, you read around her snubbing uh, Labour, et cetera. Now, she came out and said, well, no, I'm not snubbing anyone, but I'm focused on the work of the trade union. And that's what I'll be doing in the months and year ahead. And I have to say, safe to say that is what she's done. What she said was the union members, look at the headline there, cannot afford to wait for a Labour government. In other words, the, the, the United said our agenda will not be waiting for politicians, waiting for Labour to get in. Instead, and look at the, the, the quote I've circled in the, in the main headlines underneath, the task of rebuilding and strengthening the trade union movement has to begin in the workplace. In other words, she said, I'll be taking my disputes to you guys that are attending this webinar to employers to the hr community and um, to fight if you like for workers rights and that's exactly i think fair to say what we've seen is it not for the last year whether it's the cost of living that's not an issue for government according to the unions is it that's an issue for business that's an issue for employers um, to correct some of the in imbalance of what large uh, businesses are paying executives or profits that are being taken and trying to correct that for the uh, for the shop floor worker. Um, so I think that really is consistent with what Sharon Graham predicted a year ago that we've seen through this, as I call it, summer of discontent with industrial unrest and strike action uh, and pay disputes on quite a large scale. So that's the context I think we are all living and working in now um, in terms of the trade union climate, if you like. And what I'd like to do um, for the rest of this session is really to pull out some top 10 tips, as I called it, of my experience over the years in dealing with uh, trade union advice, um, some of the uh, issues that we see in our own practice and have seen in particular um, over the last several months, some of the experiences and uh, tips, if you like, on consistent uh, issues that we've um, found ourselves in, in the Burness Paul team um, having to advise our clients on, uh, on trade disputes. So number one, in at number one, and pros it poses a provocation. Why do workers join a trade union nowadays? I've just had the slide about the declining numbers. Are they still relevant? Why are we hearing so much about the trade unions? Why has everyone probably got a view now on whether it's right or wrong to call a strike? And should uh, uh, train uh, drivers be going on strike and preventing people getting the kids to school and university and, and people to come to, their, to their, their job instead of working from home? So why do people join? Um, it's a fundamental right, first of all. And this is something I always touch on in the industrial relations work that I do. And we must remember you have a legal right in the UK, anyone to choose to be a union member if you wish. That's a fundamental right. And I often add to that fundamental right to be a union member if you wish, or if you don't wish. That's your personal choice. It's private. It's really sensitive information. And all of you know, in the HR community, certainly you don't ask someone what their affiliation is. That could get you into grounds of victimization. But again, it's that distinction between membership of a trade union, a personal choice, 
and the right or the choice, if you like, of a business to decide if it recognizes a trade union, to give it that platform, that foothold in your organization. The two don't have to go hand in hand. So why do people join trade unions nowadays? I work with an employee relations consultant that I've learned a great deal from over the years who talks about the ABC of why people join a trade union. A, advocacy, to give you a voice to get free legal advice, to turn up at a disciplinary or grievance hearing. That's a big part of why someone might join. B, benefits. And you may see this actually, discounted uh, uh, gym membership, discounted travel insurance, uh, legal fees uh, covered. So the benefits, the pool of a massive organization like Unison or Unite, a members only club, gives you additional membership benefits. Some people like that. I think in the last probably decade, that's gradually eroded as we can get, you know, pick up at Tesco a flyer for pet insurance or your bank will offer you uh, travel insurance as part of a, a current account and such, such like. So other organizations now will offer certain benefits instead. Um, and of course, it costs money to join a trade union. And again, I'd, forgive me if this sounds pithy, but if you're paying a direct debit of, say, £15 a month, versus 15 pounds a month for the Netflix or the Disney Plus membership. I know what my kids would be saying, which one's the first to go in a cost of living crisis when you're looking at trimming the direct debits. So again, that might be a, where we've seen some people uh, cutting back on, uh, on, on those additional costs. So benefits, cost and payment comes into there. And C, which I think must resonate, conscience. So the conscience, I am a trade union man. My dad was a trade union man. My grandpa worked in maritime sector, heavy engineering. So conscience, some people just believe it's right to do that and to be part of the trade union movement. And that will probably be relevant uh, in particular in say the public sector where it's more common and you're used to being part of that club and part of that trade union movement. And that's all fine. And you respect the right, as I say, of everyone um, to choose to be a member or not if they wish. So moving from that membership and that representation, question number two, how does a trade union get recognition? How does it get recognized? And can we, if you recognize a union uh, in this group, can you de-recognize? So there's really three ways primarily how a trade union uh, can get recognition, can get that foothold uh, within an organization. And the first will be voluntary recognition. OK, that's probably the vast majority of you uh, who are taking part today um, who have a trade union. The vast majority, I would say, would be purely voluntary. And as I mentioned, it's a business decision. Do we volunteer to, to recognize the union? Uh, do we want to play with the union? Do we want to be in a partnership, actually? A lot of these agreements are often called partnership agreements where they work. Um, it's a two-way street that's entirely voluntary. Most common, as I say, and oftentimes you will see that quote right at the end, and I'll usually build this language if I'm drafting a voluntary recognition agreement, it's binding in honor only. And that's quite significant as we'll come to. It's not legally binding. There's a presumption against these agreements being legally binding. You don't march off to the sheriff court, to the, uh, the high court or the employment tribunal to enforce these documents. They're purely voluntary partnerships between the organizations. And it's therefore a question of choice. The alternative is compulsory statutory recognition. Now that came into force in 2000. I've done a lot of these applications over the years. You certainly know about it when it happens. If I pull up the next slide, I'm sure you can all catch that. There you go. Got that. Everyone worked through from the top right to the bottom. There's the flow chart. I say with a smile, the high court in the first judicial review involving that process called it of having Byzantine complexity. And believe me, if you're in there, guys, it is tough. It's heavy going. The deadlines move quickly. The CAC is the body that adjudicates the Central Arbitration Committee, it's called. Some of you might have been involved in it. I call it like the Employment Tribunal on Steroids. You've got a professor of labor law and very eminently people um, sitting there as well. So as I say, you know about it. If you, at this top, you get a written request for compulsory recognition. But broadly speaking, this was a Tony Blair era innovation. So new labor came in and gave back to the trade union movement, but in a, in a bit more 
of a of a right leaning fashion. They didn't give the right of any union to get recognition if they choose. Instead, they said, broadly speaking, of a majority or actually 40 percent of the workers, if they want it and they push for it, and we get a petition and we get a, a poll and a vote, then you get a recognition imposed upon you. So that's kind of in a nutshell what the compulsory process involved. There is a, there's a legal process for unions to go through. And a final one, it does transfer under Chupi, our favorite Chupi, unless that's uh, abolished. Um, Rachel might touch upon uh, some of the changes coming from European law. Um, but anyway, recognition does follow uh, with Chupi, but it can be de-recognized pretty easily often, actually, if there's voluntary recognition in the first place. So second question, then de-recognition, never something to do lightly, but I want to flag it there and I flag it in the context of the voluntary recognition piece in particular, because that's most common. And I have to say, folks, I've been asked a lot about this of, of late, particularly where relations have been strained in this summer of discontent between employer and trade union. And maybe no wonder if a, if a union is coming on the offensive and calling a strike action, it's no surprise a client might be saying, David, you know what? I don't think this relationship works anymore. This partnership is broken. It's moribund. What do I do about it? Can I get out of it? So I open with the bullet point, easy question mark. Actually, let's open with the good news. Yeah, it's easy. If it's a voluntary recognition agreement, it's not legally binding, it's not enforceable. Yeah, you can de-recognize it. OK, you say we're not playing anymore. We're not volunteering anymore. We hereby serve immediate notice as I once did. Other times it might have three months, six months in the, in the recognition agreement, but that's not binding either. You can't go off to court to enforce it. So, on, yeah, it's pretty easy to do legally. However, it's a massive decision. If I tell you I've done it in over 20 years of advising in this area, I think three times have I ever advised a client on de-recognizing their trade union and writing that simple letter because look at the ancillary risks no surprise no brainer you'll probably get a strike on your hands industrial action of some sort you could then face re-recognition through the cac process on the previous slide comes down to a numbers game. So you think about a sense of the density. If you've got a feeling for how many members, one client that you recognize, they thought it was about 10%. And it did wither after that. They didn't get another uh, reapplication. And then the more sinister end, if I can call it that. Now, Sharon Graham was the author and the uh, brainchild, if you like, of leverage, as you might call it. That's the reputational damage. That's using uh, the power of persuasion. That's using social media, bad mouthing a company to affect their reputation. So don't, you know, that, and they're very sophisticated, all unions now on the use of technology and other demonstrations, if you like, to, to push their agenda. And then fourthly, inducement claims, which we'll touch on later. So there's a real legal risk of doing it, even though it's quite easy. Then just very quickly on compulsory recognition, quite the opposite I pose there, it's almost impossible. I think there's been one application ever that's come back to the CAC for a, for a company to get out of recognition that was imposed upon them by a trade union. There's a mirrored legal process. If you look at the previous slide, it works the same way. So the flip side is you need 40% of your people to say we don't want that union anymore. That's hard to get that if they've already got in, say, three years ago, because a voluntary, semi-voluntary agreement must last at least three years anyway. OK, so de-recognition, never look at it lightly, but it's understandable why many businesses have been tempted to look at it in present time. So what is recognition? Talked about membership, personal choice. What does it mean to be recognized? There's the objective. It's collective bargaining. That's the prize for the trade union movement. That's why they push for it. That's the foothold it gives a union. It's negotiations between employer and a recognized union on any of those topics there from terms, conditions, often very wide of wide recognition agreement, or usually it's the big three, as I call it, that you would only ever get from compulsory pay hours and holidays. And they are the big one, pays the biggie, isn't it? So it's negotiation, a proper foothold into your business. And I have to say, guys, that's why the boardroom will take notice. You mean I can't just fix pay every year? I can't tell them what I get paid, performance related? We're paying everyone 5%, 10%, even though they're not any good at their job or they're not delivering or they're on a PIP improvement plan? Yep, that's collective bargaining. 
And the union like it to be pretty flat. They like a, a simple 7% for everyone, regardless of what role you're in. So that's what the union movement are looking for. And it's negotiation. I talk often about that's the gold standard. The gold, if you imagine the gold is negotiation, the silver is consultation, which those without a trade union will do, won't you? If you want to change terms, conditions, you consult. Um, and then the, the, the bronze would be information, direct information, updates, telling your people, telling your people what they get paid without any consultation. Perfectly common, isn't it? Salary review and a contract. That's what you're getting paid next year. There's no negotiation. So very, very different model. And that's why, as I say, a union knocking at the door is not something you, you would uh, look at lightly as an HR professional advising the business. Um, and it covers, importantly, look at the third bullet point, everyone in the bargaining unit, regardless of your union affiliation. So if you recognize a, a trade union for all production operatives, whether they're a member or not, and you're not going to know who's a member, remember, when you implement a pay deal of 7%, everyone gets it. And it results in a collective agreement. Now, actually, if I was to be selling you the dream of, rate of union recognition, that's probably the best part of it for HR people. That's what will make your life easier at the end of the process. Because if you think, let's say you want to change shift working, and you came to Rachel and I and said, how do I change shifts for a whole group of, say, 200 operatives at the factory? And there's no trade union. What would we advise you? Consult, con consult, consult. Get into little huddles, maybe town hall, toolbox talks, etc. Then issue new contracts. Um, you know, tell people why you're doing it. Give them time to try and get them to sign and return it. You've got your whole HR team chasing people up. Why didn't you sign it? All of that. So that's quite a laborious process. If you had a trade union and not an employee forum, but a trade union, once you've agreed it with the trade union, you tell everyone. That's the beauty of collective bargaining. You've now, we've reached collective agreement with our trade union with effect from the, the 1st of October, you're all now going to be paid 7% extra, or you're all now going to work in these shifts. Easier said than done getting the union to agree, of course, but that is the power of collective bargaining. That's what it achieves ultimately with the collective agreement that just miraculously slips into everyone's contracts of employment, all hundred or so staff. Um, so how does a union then get its mandate? If the union has that power, and it is a power, as I say, how does it get the mandate? I'm often asked this question and what the employer's rights are here. Um, so first of all, the, the norm will be, and I touched on in my introduction, a consultative ballot or a workplace ballot is often heard, uh, it's often called. So it could be a WhatsApp group. It could be done on social media. It could be a show of hands down the local pub or restaurant in a room that's, uh, that, that's booked. Um, and the question I then most often get asked is, what's the legal status? How do we know? They said, what did the union tell you? It was a landslide. A vast majority voted. You say to them, well, how many? Well, I'm not telling you. Oh, it's just loads. It was everyone. Well, how do you know? It could be, for all you know, 10 people that bothered to turn up and put their hand up or vote in the, in the Google or the uh, Survey Monkey poll. So they have no legal status for you, I'm afraid, as an employer. They have a status of sorts for the union. So Unite, Unison, GMB, they decide in their constitution how they get their mandate from the workers, okay, from their members. But I'm afraid to say, unlike strike ballots, there's no regulation around it. And that may be where Quasi Quarteng is going to change things in saying, actually, if it's pay, you need to actually prove it to us that they got a democratic vote and that the vote was 50% probably is the threshold I imagine they would do. Um, so that's quite unregulated now, but could change. And that really then highlights that are they, dem are they Democrat? Are they representative of the workforce? Because for all of you in HR, you'll think very much about a very now and recent uh, trend of employee voice, of employee engagement, a very positive thing. Only union members will have that say to get the union mandate. Now, you might say, well, of course, fair enough. They're only paying their dues. They only pay their 15 quid a month. Why should anyone else? But is that democratic of the whole workforce, remember, the whole, um, the whole bargaining unit? And that gets you my final bullet point. Sometimes where situations you have a tail wagging the dog. So we had one organization that had only 10% density, and it was a landslide vote to reject pay. 
Well, how many was that? They're only 10% members out of the whole work, the whole bargaining unit anyway. So it really wasn't. There was 90% was my provocation to the chief exec who was very, had a social conscience, if you like, that I will always have a trade union. I will always give a voice to my people. I said, well, with respect, what about the 90% who don't pay the union dues? They're not in the club. What voice have they got? And unsurprisingly, we took them in the direction of looking at setting up an all-employee forum as well. Number five, halfway there, can we give our people a pay increase anyway if we can't reach agreement with the union? What if we can't get collective agreement when you recognize a union? And this was a very common thing that happened, I, I, I recall, many years ago, where you effectively would take the rug from under the feet of the union that was either threatening industrial action or in industrial action, say, look, we're paying it anyway. You know, we're between 4% and 6%. We're just going to pay the 4%. You can't do that now if you recognize a trade union. So for those of you that recognize Unite, you'll have seen that. I saw a number of these in the last year. They present their pay claim. You negotiate over it. You hope to get agreement, collective agreement. But if you don't, and I only mention, I promise never uh, the black letter law, but section 145B, if there's one you take away, please, if you find yourself in the situation, read that section. Inducement claims, they're called. Second bullet point is no longer permissible to offer to change contracts directly with employees to avoid or outside of collective bargaining. It's to stop the unscrupulous employer from doing that, from taking the wind uh, out from the sails of the trade union, going direct to their people. Only union members can make the claim, and it's only for recognized unions or those unions seeking recognition. And then it's scary. This will get your oops mandatory award, a punitive award, really a punishment of currently 4,554 people per employ uh, per union member. Now, do the math if you like, if you have a large workforce with a, a high union density. And I'll not dwell on this for time, but Costal was the leading case of the Supreme Court last year. And the main takeaway for us as, as advisors is the dilemma, have you exhausted collective bargaining? Because that's what the Supreme Court said. If you've exhausted collective bargaining, you can prove you've done everything you can. The union should not have a right of veto. It's not fair for them to just block it all together. OK, so next slide, I do touch on that probably real dilemma. How do you prove it? So our main advice is get your recognition agreements looked out, dust them off, check the disputes procedure, check the escalation, stage one, stage two, probably stage three ACAS. Have you really exhausted it? I've had to advise a couple of organizations in the last several months on, you know, can we genuinely say we've done everything we can and now we're having to go ahead? It's not fair. There's a genuine business purpose to pass on this pay to our people. And one client, the reason was we were losing staff. There was a retention issue. People were leaving over pay. We need to go ahead and do it. But again, you're looking at weighing up risk and reward there. So cost out and section 145B, take great care. Next question, I was asked this by a client to do some research into, could we see a general strike in the UK? You know, given just the extreme volume um, of, of, of strikes across the country, they asked the question, could we see back to the 70s, a general strike in the UK? And the answer I gave really is probably not, okay? Not in the sense of concerted action across every organization or every employer within a, a sector, say. And the reason for that is there are very strict balloting requirements that I touched on under the Trade Union Act of 2016. So you know about it when, as I hate the term, I, but I do use it, when a bomb goes off or is going to go off, you get a bomb warning. The union have to ballot their people. They have to send a notice of industrial action to you. So you know when it's going to happen. Uh, within a period of time and usually running from start to finish, probably over a period now of about six weeks, including the ballot, which takes about three weeks to organize. So you get time to prepare for it. And workers at every separate employer, legal entity, you know, whether it's in local authority, NHS, whether it's in Acme Limited and a subsidiary, you've got to have a separate ballot per separate employer. However, what the TUC were being uh, uh, um, were, were being canvassed and came out and said they would consider doing is what they called a great word synchronized industrial action, coordinated action. 
So it could happen on a synchronized basis where the unions say, you go first, you follow, you know, they could cause damage, cause most upset and disruption by coordinating on behalf of multiple unions because each union has to ballot separately. So it's hard, I think, to get an absolute general strike and um, you'd have separate ballots at separate workplaces unless it's an aggregate with the same dispute. So we look at these things carefully, as I've done for one client, very, very carefully, meticulously over the last several months as they've headed into a strike ballot. So general strike, I think, would be difficult unless in a purely coordinated fashion concerted by uh, the, uh, the TUC. And there's a classic question when you're in strike or it's coming up and it adds to your communication with staff. Do we have to pay employees? First question, second biggie, can we sack them? Straight answer to number one is easy. No, you don't get paid. If an employee takes part in a strike, it's a breach of contract because they're withdrawing their labor. They're not turning up. They're not getting paid. Simple as that. Take care in other areas like short of strike, industrial action, short of strike, a go slow and overtime ban. You might be able to withhold some payments, but not withhold all payments. And for one client, I had a great question um, just a few weeks ago, what we call partial performance of the contract. Someone turns up for, say, half their shift and goes home. You can tell them in advance, we're not accepting partial performance. If you don't work your whole shift, you're getting paid none of it. So there's rules around that as well. Dismissal. Okay. Can we sack everyone? Used to happen. Anyone old enough to remember? Dundee, Timex, uh, the miners strike. Entire workforces were sacked. An entire new workforce, scabs, crossed the picket line and walked in to replace an entire factory environment. So you can dismiss entire workforces, but now at law, only after a 12-week protected period. And that's quite a long time, isn't it? So only after 12 weeks can you consider. Now, again, my goodness, what a bold step would that be? I've not seen that in my career span advising, seeing entire uh, you know, workforces being dismissed. And in any event, you have to first evidence that you've tried to resolve uh, the dispute, for example, at ACAS. Can, worker, can we hire agency workers to break strikes? You can see I'm posing these questions because they have quite clever answers to them or topical answers. The answer a year ago, uh, gosh, four months ago would have been absolutely not. And don't forget, because it's a crime. If you'd hired agency workers through an employment agency, the agency would be committing a crime. And you could be faced with the law, uh, as, a, uh, as English lawyers would call it, of aiding and abetting a criminal act. And then, of course, the Tories stepped in, and that was a high-profile one, 21st of July, very topical, and they amended it in that piece of legislation. I was asked this morning, actually, who it affected. Was it by scale? Was it by industry? No, I actually looked at it. It just deleted. You know, it's one of those short pieces of law that deletes the section from an earlier law. So now you can, you can hire temporary workers, you can hire agency workers from an employment agency, and uh, that is no longer illegal. Surprise, surprise, Unison are all over this, and they're taking a judicial review to challenge that as going to the human right of freedom of association. So watch this space, Unison, as you know, have had quite some, some success on the likes of tribunal fees, and they might have another one to notch up. I pose a question at the end. I remember this came up in a lot of talk. Mick Lynch was, uh, was uh, grilled on this. And obviously he was furious at the RMT about the thought of abolishing that law. But he did come out and say, well, where are you going to get train, uh, train drivers? You find me an employment agency that's got a bunch of train drivers in their stocks. So there might be a limit to what you can do with agency workers. But for some of you, you certainly could use that to, to deal with, as we call it, your business continuity plans to top up your workforce, other than just by bringing along management or people from other sites. So it certainly makes it, again, easier for employers. Um, the penultimate one, what are the rules on picketing? So we've seen a fair bit, and that's the profile stuff. It may be adjunct to leverage, you know, really getting the publicity. We had one client with a strike where, um, you know, they, they, they certainly flex the rules that we're going to touch on to say the least of them being polite. They went beyond what they were meant to do. And the union admitted that actually on day one, oh, we wanted a photo shoot for STV News. So, you know, this is about getting as many people to make it look like I drove by uh, my office here in, in, in Glasgow um, during one of the strikes, honk, 
you know, honk if you support us. One of my colleagues thought it was me honking. It wasn't. I just, I have to be neutral. Um, so, you know, they want to create a fuss, if you like, and get some profile. But in a nutshell, what I would turn you to is always do, because it never sticks in your mind. You don't do this often. There's a code of practice of 2017 on it. So turn to the, um, the code of practice that gives some rules. A picket supervisor was a, a new innovation from 2016. But here's a couple of key things. The, piece, the picket must be peaceful. It must be at or near the entrance to your place of work, not further away, and no more than six picketers. Not many, but the unions will flex it, as I say. We've seen one where demonstrations were just a little bit further down the line. So we had to write and make complaints. You could ultimately threaten interdict or injunction. Um, the union might lose its immunity from, from being sued. So it's a bold step to get it wrong. So you might have, you, you have to be vigilant. How about that? You need to be vigilant um, when dealing with picketing to make sure that the union have complied with the, the, the code of practice. And my final one, um, should we engage with our workforce during a trade dispute? Should we talk to, should we communicate? And if so, how? Now, that's a talk in itself, guys, but I'll pull up a few tips on there. And the simple answer is, surprise, surprise, absolutely. And I, I think it, you'd be forgiven if your managers, if this is the stuff that you see. Now, this is the real more sinister end of leverage. The black rat, as it's called, that kind of scab type mentality, protests. Those are pictures of the black rat from the States, but it has crept over to the UK. And there down um, at one of the ports in the south of England was a sign of that proper leverage in action. And you'd be forgiven, therefore, as a manager, if you shut yourself away and thought, this is too hard. I don't want to get involved in this. But how about that? In times of change, the rule is to over communicate. And that must be right. So engage with your people. The trend is have a forum. Talk about it. Don't shut yourself away. Have employee voice at a forefront and have managers. Use your managers as the foot soldiers to drive that communication through manager-led uh, communication. And remember, this is not anti-union. And all the work I do, it's not anti-union. There's no point in being anti-union. That will be thrown against you um, if that were to creep out and not least into the media and your reputation. But instead, pro-employee, all your people, give a voice to everyone, regardless of their affiliation, whether a union member or not. Over-communicate and out-communicate the trade union, because believe me, the trade union movement are incredibly sophisticated. So think about a WhatsApp group. As soon as you've just left a pay talk and the pay has been, the pay deal has been rejected, the union will be straight on to their members through social channels. I had one client, oh, I didn't think we could tell our people. I thought that meeting was, was confidential. Well, if it's not been said confidential, it's not mediation, then absolutely the union are telling people you should be doing it as well. Um, so deal direct. There's some, um, some, we'll share the slides with the pack. Deal direct with your people. Inform them through any forums that you have. Respect their right to be union members. But number four, consult, consult, consult. That's always the rule. And I love this quote um, that's been attributed to Sir George uh, Bernard Shaw. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. We're great at talking to our people. I'm sure we told them. I'm sure they know. Do they really? Can you evidence? Because that illusion is always out there. If you think you're good at communication, check yourself again and be sure that you actually do that. Now, on communication, Rachel, sorry, I'll, I'll hand over you any minute, but forgive me if I just give one final plug. I'm sorry, forgive the humble brag, but we're incredibly proud of this, guys. We picked up the award on Thursday evening at the Scottish Legal Awards for Employment Law Team of the Year 2002. And here's the, the award uh, to, to prove it. <laughs> um, sorry, a bit cringe, I know. But actually, the reason I wanted to share that in this group was on the night, one of the things that was singled out by the judging panel, we were told, was the quality and the extent of our communications with our clients, particularly through COVID, all of these sessions, these webinars. So it's a thank you to all of you who supported us through that time and by attending these sessions. So we were all proud as a team to pick up that award. And as someone in the team said this morning, yeah, do mention it. That's the whole point, is it not, of doing these things. So thank you, everyone. And on that note, I will pause and I will hand over over uh, to Rachel.
Thank you very much. Nothing wrong with a humble brag, in my <laughs> humble opinion. <laughs> um, thanks so much, David. Um, that was really useful, really helpful. Um, I just want to use the time that we have left just to touch on a couple of recent cases. I can see we've got something in the chat um, already. Oh, thank you, Marie. A nice little congratulations there. I was just about to say, if anyone's got any questions um, on what David just covered, do fire them into the chat while I'm speaking. Um, you know, it won't interrupt me, and then David will pick up what he can once I've finished. Um, actually, it's uh, topical that David was just mentioning our communications on uh, on COVID there, because with apologies, the first case that I'm going to cover is actually a COVID uh, related case. Now, some of you may have have read or attended uh, one of these webinars previously, when we spoke about a case um, involving an individual who'd been off with COVID for nine months. And it was a bit of a landmark tribunal judgment in that they held in that case that that individual's, it was actually long COVID, amounted to a disability. And that was the, it was the first case of its kind, as far as uh, we are aware. Um, conscious that that may have put the frighteners on a little bit um, in terms of dealing with COVID related absences um, or dealing with you know, dismissals where it involves someone who's been absent for COVID, um, whether for a short or a long period of time. So there's now been a further case which involves similar facts um, that I hope will help to put minds at rest somewhat. So the claimant, Miss Quinn, um, she'd been employed for less than two years. We're not talking about an unfair dismissal type claim. Um, but she'd been absent from work for two and a half weeks with COVID and was dismissed. Um, now, the judgment act doesn't actually say why she was dismissed, but I think we can safely assume that it was absence related. Um, and she raised a number of claims, including claims of disability discrimination. A couple of months after she was dismissed, she was diagnosed with long COVID, um, but she hadn't been diagnosed with long COVID at the point of her dismissal. However, the symptoms that she was experiencing at the point of her dismissal were quite severe. So she experienced fatigue, shortness of breath, generalized aches, headaches, brain fog, um, and was struggling with several of her day-to-day -day activities, including shopping and driving, for example. Um, so so quite, quite intense symptoms that she was experiencing at the point of her dismissal. Now, what she tried to argue in terms of seeing that her um, COVID amounted to a disability was, listen, the symptoms I had at the point of my disability, uh, sorry, the point of my dismissal, albeit I hadn't been diagnosed with long COVID at that time, but they were the same symptoms that I had when I was diagnosed with long COVID and I actually had long COVID for a very long time. She also sought to argue that her, uh, her employer should have known that she was likely to develop long COVID on the basis of the um, seriousness of her symptoms. Um, and furthermore, she pointed to that earlier case that I mentioned where uh, long COVID had been found to be a disability. The respondent, on the, also her employer, on the other hand, argued that they could not have determined with um, you know, the benefit of hindsight that she would have developed long COVID. And actually, it should have been based on the knowledge that they had at the time, which was simply that she had COVID. Um, and the Employment Tribunal agreed with the respondent's arguments on that, which I think is a, certainly a common sense type um, decision. So I hope that that gives a little bit of comfort in terms of dealing with COVID related absences and I think serves um, as a reminder that knowledge is so important in these cases, a tribunal will look at what an employer knew or what they ought to have known. And actually, they determined that most people who get COVID don't get long COVID so it wasn't foreseeable that it would have turned into that. Um, but that said, I think the current figure is that there are 1.2 million people suffering with long COVID at the moment. So I think these cases, we're going to see more of them. Um, but this serves as a kind of useful signpost. Just going to check if we've got any questions on that before we go ahead. Oh, lovely. Just making sure that everyone can see me. Do you think that someone with severe symptoms now without a diagnosis of long COVID could successfully argue that employer should have known? Let me just read that again. I think that would very much, so that's Kelly, thanks for that question. I think that would very much depend on how long the individual had been off. 
Um, and actually, if they've had COVID, it should be pretty easy for them to get a diagnosis of long COVID if they're still experiencing those symptoms. So a tribunal would want to see, particularly for someone with more than two years service, that the employer has explored that and sought occupational health or other medical input before making a decision. Um, but yes, to answer your question, I do think that an employee could successfully argue that. Um, moving on to the second case now I should say that all of these cases will be covered in our written bulletin that will be coming out and um, so I really they're they're very in-depth cases or at least the next one is so I'll just summarize it very quickly given time constraints um the second case um that I want to touch on deals with something that's received an enormous amount of media attention so it deals with so-called gender critical beliefs now, I know that that is a term that some find offensive or controversial, but it is the term that's often used to describe the belief that there are only two sexes, male and female, and that someone's sex is biological and immutable and cannot be conflated with their gender identity. You all will probably have heard about the four statter case that received a huge amount of media attention, but this case that I'm going to discuss is actually a more recent case on roughly the same topic. And I think is indicative of the direction of travel that um, these kind of so-called gender critical cases are going in and actually this case expands upon the principles in that case. So the claimant in this case, Miss Bradley, sorry, Miss Bailey, was a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and she shares roughly the same views as Forstatter did, so she believes that sex is unchangeable. She complained to her colleagues about Garden Court Chambers becoming a Stonewall diversity champion, and she argued that Stonewall advocated trans extremism and was complicit in a campaign of intimidation of those who questioned gender self-identity. She then, similar to Forstatter, tweeted her views opposing trans right campaigns, which led to Chambers receiving complaints and tweets about her views stating that her um, opinions were transphobic. Then enter Stonewall. Um, Stonewall also complained to Chambers about the content of her tweets and her views. In response to all of that, and admittedly dealing with a very difficult situation, uh, Chambers tweeted that they would launch an investigation into complaints about Miss Bailey. And the outcome of the, that investigation was that two of her tweets were found to find to be or likely to offend the bar standards board code um, which is a code which contains the rules about how barristers uh, behave and work. Miss Bailey interestingly brought complaints not only against Chambers so where she worked but also against Stonewall. She alleged that um, Stonewall had um, induced cham her Chambers to discriminate against her so quite a novel claim. Um, and she claimed that Chambers, by um, tweeting that they were investigating the complaints and by coming to the conclusion that they did on those complaints, had discriminated against her. Interestingly, um, the parties in the case agreed that her gender critical beliefs amounted to a protected belief under the Equality Act. But Miss Bailey, as I mentioned earlier, also held some additional views which go beyond those dealt with in the four statter case. So she also asserted that her view that, and I'm going to read this out because it's tricky, gender theory, i.e. if a man identifies as a woman, he is a woman, or if a woman identifies as a man, she is a man, as promoted by Stonewall, is severely detrimental to women, including that it denies them female-only spaces, and to lesbians in that it labels them as bigoted for being same-sex attracted. And she argued that that was also a protected belief and the Employment Tribunal agreed with her. Um, Miss Bailey ultimately received £22,000 in, um, in compensation for injury to feelings. Um, so quite a chunky, uh, a chunky payout. Um, her claim against Stonewall, however, was unsuccessful. The tribunal held that Stonewall had not induced chambers to discriminate against her but had um, simply protested about her views which it was permitted to do. So I appreciate that's all a bit of a legal maze um, but I flag it just to, as a reminder that these views are capable of protection as um, philosophical beliefs under the Equality Act and employers must be incredibly careful to balance the rights of those holding those views with um, the rights and views of others you know, noting that gender reassignment is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. Um, so after all of that um, not particularly lighthearted case summary, I just wanted to flag um, some big news, at least for um, people in the employment law world last week that you may have read about. So 
the retained EU law revocation and reform bill was published last week and it may have a sub uh, substantial consequence for UK employment law. Um, so the aim of the bill, roughly speaking, is to dramatically speed up the process of removing and replace, replacing retained EU laws. It provides that on the 31st of December 2023, so not very long away, retained EU law, including legislation introduced to comply with EU law, will be repealed unless the government takes action to retain it or replace it. This, from an employment law aspect, could impact loads of impor important laws from our perspective. So potentially the working time regulations, dealing with things like your 40 hour limit on working week, rest periods, holiday pay, etc. Um, it could also impact on two pay. I know you're all on mute, but I'm sure a few of you cheered there. <laughs> Don't get too excited. I can't see the, uh, the reforms being uh, too exciting from our perspective. Um, but I mean, I hate this phrase. It's a bit of a um, watch this space type thing. I think the bill is going to be really fiercely opposed. Um, not least because of the potential practical impact. When a lot of EU laws were introduced, we had a huge amount of time to get ready for them, but now we're staring down the barrel of these laws being whipped from under our feet with very, very little notice. And where does that leave you, for example, with employment contracts that reflect a position, for example, in relation to holiday pay under EU law, which is repealed very, very suddenly. So again, hate the phrase, but watch this space and we'll certainly be in touch with further uh, updates as this develops. So thank you very much for listening. I'm just going to have a quick look back in the chat box because um, we have just three minutes to spare. David, I don't know if you spotted any questions. I did, you want to answer I did Rachel. Me. I'll take one um, which was from Irene. A great question, um, which was against a backdrop of an increase, um, anticipated increase in collective activity. Uh, to what extent could the mediation process and the presence of a neutral mediator support negotiations between employers and trade unions? Wow, um, I am, many of you will know, a big proponent of mediation for workplace disputes, that's for sure. So absolutely, I would say Irene is the answer. However, it's a caveat, it's unusual, I find still in collective labour law um, for an independent, truly, if you like, commercial mediator to get involved, which I often find unusual. And I certainly do in my own practice recommend uh, engaging with a mediator because certainly they can do it. There's no reason why a mediator couldn't uh, mediate actually multiple disputes. Let's say if there were three recognized trade unions and the employer, a mediator can work their magic there. The reason I think it's more un uh, unusual is just um, the history, if you like, the historical norm for trade disputes tends to be the involvement of ACAS. So ACAS is a form of mediation, conciliation, um, and oftentimes they will ramp up their support for a collective dispute. So you read about that, don't you? British Airways is locked in talks at ACAS to try and break a strike or to settle their pay dispute. So we've had a culture for many decades, actually, of ACAS involvement as a form of mediation. And that tends to be the trend. And, and, and in vast majority, if you dust off your recognition agreement, it will talk about ACAS as the third and final stage um, of uh, support to try and resolve a dispute. I'd love to see actually more collective uh, disputes being resolved through truly commercial independent mediation, because the power, as we all know, of mediation is certainly there. So Irene, great question. Thanks for that. Thanks, David. And I'll just very quickly pick up um, the final question there. So can you allow someone with long COVID to work from home if they wish to? Absolutely. And that's something you should be considering as an alternative to dismissal. I think, however, the reality is for people with long COVID, they're, um, and forgive me if this is incorrect from a medical perspective, less likely to be infectious. So coming into the office shouldn't be such an issue as obviously it would be for someone with normal COVID within the infectious period, but it's the impact on their ability to work generally. So people report being extremely unwell and being extremely fatigued. Um, so it may be that working from home is of some assistance, but not um, a silver bullet, so to speak. Look at that, half past one on the nose. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, as David said earlier, if you have specific questions, please do pick up with um, David or me or your usual Vernus Paul contacts. We'll be delighted to help. But thank you so much for attending and for listening and for your wonderful questions. Thanks again, everyone. Bye now.